come there, so if you could turn on. <laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome to our 1.30 p.m. session of the December 4th, uh, 2018 special meeting of the City Council. I'd now like to ask the City Clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Crone is absent. Matthews? Here. Chase? Here. Brown is absent today. Oh, no. Absent right now. Naroyan is absent. Vice Mayor Watkins? Here. And Mayor Strauss? Here. And um, Council Member Crone is coming in now. Um, today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and is streaming on the city's website at cityofsantacruz.com. Lynn Dunton is our technician this afternoon. He's in the back room recording the meeting and I'd like to thank him for his work today. Before we begin, I'd like to first call on the city uh, attorney, Tony Condotti. Yes, thank you, <clears throat> Mayor Trazas, members of the city council. Um, we have a subsequent need item that I'm re recommending that you add to the agenda, and that is a, a closed session involving potential litigation. Um, the basis for the closed session is that um, the need to agendize this topic came to our attention after the agenda was posted, and um, there is a necessity to potentially take action before the next regular <coughs> meeting. So. Um, by motion, I would recommend that you uh, add an item to the agenda and adjourn to closed session. Is there a motion? I'll make that motion. I'll second it. So a motion by uh, Council Member Matthews, seconded by myself. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, um, that motion. I'm not sure what the issue is, that's why. Okay, do, do, um, well, before we vote, do you have a question? Well, I don't know if you... It, it was in a co uh, communication. Yeah, I... I, I Agnostic on it, then I don't. Okay, but your vote, you registered a no vote on that. So, Councilmember Crone voting no, with Councilmember Matthews, uh, Chase, Vice Mayor Watkins, and myself voting for the uh, adjournment to closed session. So, at this point, we're going to adjourn to the closed session, and then we'll resume after we have our, our discussions. Then for the meeting, we at this point I can't, but I, we'll give an update to the clerk, and she can let um, the, let let you know. Okay, thank you. And before um, we start with the regular meeting, I'm, I'd like to have the city uh, request that the city attorney report out from our closed session. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Terrazas, members of the city council. The closed session that was called as an item of subsequent need this afternoon relates to item one on your agenda, and it was. Um, and the need for the closed session was generated by a letter that was received yesterday, dated December 3rd from the California Apartment Owners Association. Um, essentially, the letter takes the position that the matter of providing notice of termination uh, for a tenancy is uh, preempted by state law, um, specifically Civil Code Section 1946.1, which um, as you know, specifies a either a 30 or 60 day notice of termination period in order for a landlord to um, terminate a lease. You might recall from the discussion last Tuesday that when this subject came up uh, and the council um, began discussing adding this item to the agenda, I had uh, indicated that based on comments I had received from uh, a council member before the meeting, I had an opportunity to do some preliminary research into that issue, and I had not located an authority that um, directly speaks to whether um, the city council has the legal ability to extend notice of termination beyond what the minimum required by state law is. Um, but I did interpret the language uh, stating that the notice shall be at least 60 days or 30 days. Um, indicates a floor, but not necessarily a ceiling. Um, the Apartment Owners Association letter cites a reported appellate decision from 1987 entitled the Tri-County Apartment Association versus the City of Mountain View. Um, that case didn't directly deal with a notice of termination. It dealt with an ordinance that required at least 60 days notice before a rent increase could go into effect. And it was challenged by the Tri-County Apartment Owners Association on the basis that a different section of the Civil Code, 
not 1946.1, specifies that um, a landlord cannot change the terms of a rental agreement of a month-to-month -month tenancy uh, without providing at least 30 days notice. Um, the association challenged that on the basis that, uh, again, a different civil code section requires um, notice before the terms of a rental agreement uh, can be implemented of at least 30 days. And of course, a rent increase is a, ch is a change in the terms of a rental agreement. Um, in that case, the Court of Appeal for the Sixth Appellate District, which Santa Cruz is a, a part of, concluded that with regard to matters of notice, uh, in landlord-tenant relationships, the state has indeed occupied the entire field and therefore that the city is preempted from adopting uh, an ordinance that requires notice in excess of what the state law provides. Um, I think what occurred here is that during the time I had preliminarily to research that issue uh, before the last council meeting, I had looked at all of the annotations and cases that cited Civil Code Section 1946.1. It did not come up. Um, had I had additional time, it's very likely that I would have uh, uncovered this case, but the Tri-County Apartment Association, or the uh, California Apartment Owners Association has um, cited the right case. In this, and also indicated that should the council move forward today, it intends to file an immediate legal challenge to the validity of the ordinance, which in my view, given the authority cited, um, would be meritorious. The Apartment Owners Association would likely, in all likelihood, prevail in that litigation. And so moving forward uh, exposes the city to, in addition to the cost of defending that litigation, um, a claim for attorney's fees and costs should the Apartment Owners Association prevail. And for that reason, it's my recommendation that the council table item one on this afternoon's agenda, um, taking action on an, an ordinance that would clearly um, be vulnerable to a legal challenge is, is not a prudent measure at this time. Thank you, Mr. Condotti. And one question might come up and be what type of liability or what level of liability might the city um, have the challenge would be by way of a writ of mandate um, that would is is basically a standard lawsuit, but it but it n narrowly addresses the issue of the ordinance's validity, which is a matter of statutory construction. Um, but still, certainly, the city would be looking at uh, costs for defense in the probably the high five figures and an attorney's fees claim that's probably orders of magnitude greater than that. Thank you. Yeah. We, um, at this point, I would bring it back to the council for action. I will tell you that if, um, depending on you know, the council action here, um, members of the public are um, certain that are here for this item, item one, are welcome to email the council regarding comments on this. Um, I think that we've um, had, uh, if you were here uh, last Tuesday, several hours of discussion on a variety of, about a variety of topics, and I'd like to just, first of all, uh, see what the council would like to do in regards to this matter. Council Member Matthews. Based on the advice of the attorney, I'll move that we table this item. I'll second that. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Council Member Crone. Yeah, I just wondered from the city attorney, um, what would be the difference between tabling this item versus having the conversation, letting council after the conversation, after the public spoken, have the discussion and vote up or down on the advice given to us by the, the council? And I don't at all um, think your advice is not well taken, but um, I do have a, uh, oh, go ahead. Is that, is that possible too? That would be up to the discretion of the city council. Okay, so we could have the conversation. Um, the motion on the floor I'm not gonna support because I think it's the reason that closed session is used and abused in the state of California. And I think that going into closed session, deciding something, coming out of closed session, and then we're gonna table something is the wrong way to go. You, Everything that we've heard and I heard, if we have a discussion, a public discussion over this issue, Fine, the council votes up or down on the advice of its council as well as listening to the public. And so I just think this is a bad use, once again, of closed session. I just put everybody 
uh, just be aware of the things that go into closed sessions in, in this state and also in this city, and you should be aware of this, and we don't have to be in closed session to decide this issue. If we're wrong, we're wrong, and we'll vote accordingly, but we don't have to decide that in closed session. I'll remind you, we're in open session right now and we're discussing this matter, so is there something um, you'd like to, I mean. I would like to hear from any member of the public who's here and wants to speak to this item. Okay. It, let me I'd just, like the, let the me, council let me just, to vote just, up or down well, on hold it. On. Let, let me just ask, is there any member of the public that's here to speak on item number one? Item number one. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, um, seven people, Sylvia over there. Do you count nine? I count, did you, anyone else? Okay. So, um, Council Member Matthews. Let me just say, my motion is not inconsistent with the ability to hear from the members of the public. I will say, uh, regarding the uh, meeting, the council's meeting in closed session, one of the purposes of meeting in closed session is to discuss uh, confidentially the implications, the ramifications, the issues involved in litigation or threat of litigation. It's entirely appropriate that we meet in closed session to hear from our attorney confidentially what those issues are. The action is taken in open session. So, and I'm quite comfortable hearing from the public, even though I believe we should table this item, I'm quite comfortable hearing from the public on the issues raised. Council Member Crone. Just to push back a little bit, the action to, that we're taking came out of closed session to table it instead of let's have the discussion, let's put the item out there, let's vote up or down. You don't have to table it because it's still an item on the, on the public agenda in front of us. Yeah, that is correct. So I think at this point, just hearing okay. from the council members, I'm going to open up um, the opportunity for public comment for those that came here to hear this item so we have the opportunity to speak. Council member, or city attorney Kondati. Yeah, I just, council member Crone's uh, comment, uh, I, I would just like to, it, it brought to mind that I did not report out of closed session mm -hmm that the council took no action in closed session, but did receive a report on the um, Tri-County Apartment Owners Association case and the, and the threat of litigation. So, but, but no reportable action was taken. That's so that's correct. my report out of closed session. Thank you, that's correct. Okay, um, again, those that wish to speak to this item, item number one, I'd like you to line up, those that, um, that raised their hands wishing to speak to item number one. Um, up two and a half minutes or less, if you'd like. Um, um, and if you'd line up, you can come up and speak. Yeah, whenever you are. Wait, wait a second, one moment. Wait until we get the timer set. It's 30 seconds? Yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Elise Casby and I live in Santa Cruz. I'm an activist and I just wanted to um, to say a couple of things about the vulnerability of renters right now. I think we all know that right now renters are extremely vulnerable to having their rents raised, eviction, and other hardships coming out of a divisive campaign um, on Measure M. And I think that the only people who can really help right now are city council, all of you sitting there. And I think we've had a healthy discussion in this city as like a first attempt. And just a couple of things. Um, the city of Santa Cruz actually um, passed Measure H, which failed statewide, but it was a pro-housing measure to, to help people and renters in, in their situations right now. The city of Santa Cruz also put out a healthy showing for people who favored Measure M, which I believe was around 40%, which is getting pretty close to the 50% mark. There's no doubt that it did fail, but um, we were outspent enormously. I think everybody knows that too, and it wasn't really therefore, I don't, I don't consider at least, a really fair battle um, because the message that that we were able to, the pro measure M people were able to, to wage was just, we were outspent. Um, I saw a lot of incorrect and I'll, I'll truly go so far as to say things like lies on huge signs over buildings like 40 people are going to live in this apartment and so forth. So I just wanted to stress that I think many, many people in Santa Cruz actually favor, favored this, um, this measure, but it did fail, and at this point, we need to look to city council to really help us, help renters. 
Um, and in the next few weeks, until the next council comes in, basically in January, uh, we're, we're in a situation where we just really have to ask, please, this is a time of politics governed by enormous amounts of money. It's a time of inequality. Um, it was a really hard fought measure and we're looking to you to please extend the eviction deadline here um, and also help help with some kind of uh, rent freeze measure. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Elise. Next speaker, please. Greetings. I mean, I'm here speaking on behalf of my mother, who is not able to attend. My name is Annabelle Britton, born and raised in Santa Cruz, 48 years old. My parents purchased property here in the area in 1973. This is my uh, mother's note to all of you that I will attempt to read. City Council members, I'm, and, and she's speaking on behalf of myself, our family as well. I am speaking to, to you today as a senior, low income, affordable rental, rental provider. First, I would like to say I am, am in support of, and I'm, I'm referring to you know what was going on before you guys had your little outside meeting thing. Um, I am in support of the 90 day eviction notice for renters who have rented for more than a year. I think this is reasonable in most circumstances. However, a minimum of a one year notice may be difficult or impossible under many circumstances. As a senior, I can easily see that at some point I may urgently need to move a family member or caregiver into one of my two units, or a family member may have urgent need to occupy one of my units. And I would seriously ask all of you to take that into consideration. You know, the longstanding residents that have properties here that are aging, that have been here for over 40 years, 50 years, have contributed to this community for so long and are aging and relying on their properties as their retirement and security and need care. These are the senior citizens we're talking about that have lived here for a really long time and cr contributed much. I am lucky to have lived successfully near my renters for many years on a very small piece of property. However, I have worked for decades, decades, to pay for and maintain my property for my family and myself. Not having access to my own property could create more difficulty for me than for my renters. There needs to be more flexibility. And this is not in denial or lack of recognition that housing is an issue here and affordable housing is a serious thing and it needs to happen in a more appropriate, balanced way. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Carol Long. I'm a resident <clears throat> and have been for 30 years of Santa Cruz. Um, I, I don't see any need for closed sessions for this city council. And I would urge that you do not have them unless it's absolutely necessary, say in the case of employee discussions. And I don't see any need for uh, this important issue particularly to be considered in a closed session. And I do have a question. <clears throat> Rent control is legal and uh, evictions protections are legal in other cities in California. And I'm wondering uh, with that in mind and the fact that our rent control campaign has been based on those other cities how it is that our eviction protections are now considered by some court to have been illegal. And I would like uh, the city attorney to address that if it's at all possible here, because it just seems uh, out of whack with what I've heard. And uh, really, I'm, I'm astounded that we can't have the eviction protections that we are looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please.
Good morning, Mayor Tarasas and council members. My name is Jeffrey Smedberg. Um, I've been active in the rent control campaign, and I really appreciate your, uh, uh, your attempts to provide some sort of protection for renters in this uh, upcoming period. I um, did really appreciate uh, um, Mr. Contati's uh, original analysis of the proposed ordinance, and um, unfortunately, the, um, the Apartment Association continues to, um, with its massive resources, uh, have an inordinate uh, effect on our local politics. And I would encourage you to continue looking for ways to provide uh, protections for renters uh, in this city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, I'm Cynthia Berger. I um, just wanted to share that the city of San Jose, the way they did it was they made it optional for landlords to give their tenants a 90 day notice, or if they didn't choose to do that, then the tenants would be protected by just cause. And I think that's a great idea. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Micah Posner. I'm with Landlords <coughs> for Rent Control. And um, I think as activists, we need to be careful and considerate about what's realistic and uh, <coughs> doesn't sound like this idea is. So um, I wanna thank Council Member Watkins for bringing it forward and um, I think you should just vote not to do it and move on to other types of protections for renters. Thank you, next speaker. Hi, Stanley Sokolow. Just like to uh, quote something from the court case that was cited. It says, the extensive scheduling provided by the legislature in numerous cases that were cited in this decision, in numerous statutes, reveals that the timing of landlord-tenant transactions is a matter of statewide concern, not amenable to local variations. The ordinance directly conflicts with the legislative scheme. So you have no choice. I mean, it's spitting in the wind if you try to enact it. You, it's gonna be overturned by, the, by a, a court. So I urge you to follow your attorney's advice. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name's Sylvia Karras. Um, the conversation so far has emphasized affordability. But yesterday, I went to the HEAP meeting, and th that conversation um, reminded me that one result of too high rents is homelessness. So stopping tenants from losing their existing housing will provide even more people with a stable place to live. 14% of the 2017 point in time respondents were evicted and became homeless. So what I was thinking was if eviction notices or pre-eviction notices were also copied to SmartPath, that's the county system, um, and those situations were given immediate priority with rental assistance or dispute resolution or substance services or whatever the cause of the eviction might have been, that that would be a helpful step to take. And I thought of this just this morning or I would have emailed you and I thought maybe it would have been part of the resolution that you're not gonna pass. So I just offer that to you for your consideration. And thank you all for everything that you do. Thank you, Sylvia. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Mayor Terrazas and to Vice Mayor Watkins, members of the council. Um, I wanna say that I completely agree with you that I would be afraid if the powerful um, as, uh, Apartment Owners Association will be threatening me with a uh, lawsuit. Okay, that's spooky just to hear, and I'm pretty sure they are sitting right here with us today. But what I wanna tell you is that exactly is the same feeling that we have when we receive a rent increase. We are afraid of the powerful landlord who is giving us a rent increase or who is giving us a 30 days notice to evict. That's the same power that they hold over us renters. So I wanna let you know that I am with you in this. And I wanna let you know that we went all the way to try to pass Measure M because the situation was 
no longer been possible for us to hold. This is what happened when we came and asked one over and over again to have the 15% inclusion, inclusionary clause, to have more affordable housing, to have more low income housing and not being here. Today we are here to ask you, please help us. Please help all that people who is right now already receiving the 30, 60 days notice increase effective in January, and as I told you, in my email, one of the families in Beach Flats got a $400 increase. 200 for the year, this year, because they didn't got anyone, and 200 for the next year. So please think about that. And remember that you are the elected officials, that people vote for you to protect and to do what is right for the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other member of the public that wish to speak to this item? Okay, we see three more. So please, Mr. Norse, you want to step up? Do you have a chance? Members of the community and audience and city council. Uh, first of all, I want to note that for the first time that I remember, Mayor Terrazas has actually granted two and a half minutes per speaker rather than the usual rush two minutes. Not the three minutes as traditional, but the two and a half, and so I have to acknowledge this. Huff, Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom is a group I work with, has to do, of course, with people outside, and this is, of course, important to them. Why isn't the rent freeze and just eviction protection ordinance on this agenda? But this, is, this particular item is an attempt to address this issue. It needs to be a part of this measure, why? Because there's no legal support for tenants who, need, who will need to sue in court if the uh, gentle landlords violate this whole procedure. Secondly, in other words, if there's a 90-day notice, that's very nice, but that's not gonna stop them from giving lots of 90-day notices and ultimately rent raises and improper evictions. This was attempted to be put on the agenda last Wednesday. I attempted to do it by talking to Mayor Terrazas and by emailing Sandy Brown. Um, neither of them apparently thought it was noteworthy enough to act on this. Neither of them responded. Mayor Terrazas did say to me that he would do it if he got three members of the city council and a staff report, which is to me ridiculous and unprecedented because in the past, members of the actual City Council can get items on the agenda by simply asking him to do so. Then you leave it up to the public and the council to vote. This was blockaded and stopped. I talked to Mayor Terrazas and asked him why he didn't respond to Councilmember Brown, who announced at the last meeting that she had attempted to put this on the earlier agenda in November. He told me he had received no such communication from her, neither an email, nor a letter, nor a phone call, nor a personal contact. Maybe he can clarify that this time, or maybe Councilmember Brown can clarify, because somebody here is either forgetting or not telling the truth. I don't know what the story is, but it impacts all tenants that this was not put on the agenda for discussion and action at that time. I have no illusions that it would necessarily have passed. However, it was important that it be done because the community needs to see where this council stands clearly. So don't wait until December 11th. Organize now is my suggestion because on that date, you are going to need to be helping those tenants who are evicted for the next two or three months. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. You've already spoke, you've already spoke on this. You can speak only once, sorry about that. Next speaker, please. <laughs> No, there's not. Good afternoon, I'm Scott Graham. Um, I would suggest that you vote for this anyway and just see what happens. Uh, you know, there are co different courts fine differently and we have a fairly liberal court here in this county. And the other thing, whether or not you vote for this or not, I would like to see that whatever rules are in place on evictions as far as the, the length of time a person has, 30, 60, or 90 days, also apply to the city. That when the city red tags a house or you know says, oh, this uh, unit is not legal, that they also have to ab abide by these exact same rules, that they don't get special dispensation because of this government 
You know, I'm, hi, I'm from the government. I'm here to help you. Get, the, get out of your house. You got three days. I mean, that doesn't make sense. So if everybody else, all the landlords have to live with a 30, 60, or 90 day eviction, the city should also abide by that rule. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other members of the public other than Eric who's here to speak to this item? Any other members of the public? Okay, you're our last speaker, so you could step up if you'd like. One thing before I start. No, you could like to speak. You just. Yeah, but um, I just we had a procedural question. I got a text that someone who can't make it here wanted to maybe do it by phone. Is that possible? No. no? Okay. Um, thank you, Council. I, I don't want to speak to the substance of this. I want to speak to the procedure. I think it's highly inappropriate that you are about to consider this as an emergency ordinance because an, um, there's nothing about this that is unanticipated. I mean, the justifications given were things like it's winter. Uh, last time I checked, it was always winter in December. You guys, everyone knew that. It's not a surprise. Another justification, Measure M failed. We all knew that when Measure M was introduced in February that there was a good chance it might fail. Nothing's unanticipated. I think the thrust of this was that there are going to be all these unscrupulous landlords who would terminate all these tenancies and there'd be masses of poor renters on the streets. And, and that's just not realistic. First of all, as Mr. Kanadi explained at the September 11th meeting, it's just not practical. Most tenants are on fixed term leases. Landlords don't have the right to arbitrarily terminate those tenancies. Furthermore, despite what we've seen in these chambers, most tenants and landlords actually have good relationships. It might be hard to believe, but that's true. And, and most landlords don't want to evict their tenants. And most, most tenants don't want to leave their places. And, and most relationships like that are actually quite harmonious. Thirdly, this is absolutely the worst time of the year from a landlord's perspective to have a vacancy. You can check Craigslist right now. You'll see all kinds of listings with incentives. Excuse me. You put you on pause, please. Put on plus, a pause. Um, please, if you can, if you let the speaker, if you'd like to have conversation, please take it outside. Thank you, Mayor Terrazas. Please pause, please. Thank you. Um, so that's my third point, that they're, they're really, this is the worst time of year. It's a, the it's a best time of year as a, as a renter to find a place. Finally, every vacancy costs the landlord money, one way or another. It's just a bad, turnover is not a good thing for a landlord because you have to fix the place up, you have to paint it, you have to repair things, you have to replace things, and you have downtime. So that can vary from, you know, maybe a few hundred dollars to thousands of dollars. So it's just not realistic. I'm sure that if, you know, there will be some terminations and that's the normal course of things, but there's not gonna be a mass. So I would say, you, I felt like it was sort of an abuse of the process to can, consider this as a- Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other members of the, are there any other members of the public that wish to speak to this item? Yes, okay, step right up. You'll, any other members of the public that wish to speak to this item? You'll be our last speaker. Go right ahead, if you'd speak into the mic. My name is Sonny Lopez, and right now, I know that we have an issue with homelessness and housing with landlords. And I know that pause, the please. fact that... Would you please speak into the mic just so yes. you can move it also. All right. My name is Sonny Lopez, and I'm a member here, a citizen here of Santa Cruz, cleaning downtown street teams as well with the team members. And I know that all the tenants and landlords are in budget right now. And with having their homes being taken away and the timings on that, this is not the season and right time for it. Going back within five years, how many loss of family members have passed away and have been deceased. And going on with this year, there have been several. And I know that the fact that if we have our hearts in that fact on tenants and landlords, we could comply together on helping one another other than abandoning them and putting them out in the streets. It, like I said, this weather is very bad and severe and it's gonna only get worse. Can we actually help each other out? Please, landlords, tenants, families, this is a family issue right here. We don't need another child going away. Mine or yours, 
I have a paper for housing, a lottery ticket. I accept to give it to someone else who's been waiting on the list for a long time. I'm okay to be out there in the field. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, again, seeing no other members of the public that wish to speak to this side, I'm gonna bring it back to the council and, and close uh, the public comment period. One thing I'll say is uh, generally when people are speaking in public comment, we won't respond to that, but this is an opportunity now to discuss the matter. Um, I have other questions. We have a motion on the floor in a second. Further discussion, <laughs> Council Member Brown. Um, I just wanted to respond to uh, communications uh, report on communications between myself and Mr. Norse and uh, Mr. Norse and Mayor Trazas. I have been, I think I've been pretty clear and I will clarify again. Um, I did tell Mr. Norse last week that um, we, when I say we, that means me and uh, myself as part of a group of people who would like to see the um, rent freeze extended. I've stated that publicly. There's no surprise there. Um, wanted it to be on last week's agenda. It was not agendized. I made a request to the city manager asking whether or not it had happened. I was told no. I know that there were members of the public who made that request. Without three council members to and an agenda report from staff to get it on the agenda, that was not possible last week, nor was it possible this week. So um, it was. I think it was pretty clear during our public meeting on November 27th, that there were not three council members at this dais willing to put that on the agenda. So that's why it's not on the agenda today. And there's more work to be done. I look forward to that conversation. It's not our agenda item today. We are simply talking about whether or not to table a, pro a proposal that I believed was a compromise to try to buy some time for tenants, um, simply a 90 day eviction rather than 30 and 60 days. It's not possible um, without facing a lawsuit. And that is why I'm gonna support the motion. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Crone. Uh, a couple questions came up, uh, Tony. W one was, um, how is our, uh, Ms. Long asked, how is our eviction protection deemed illegal? But this, this doesn't really have to do with eviction protection. This, that this ordinance, that's on the agenda for today specifically deals with notice of termination. It does not address um, rent control or just cause eviction measures, which many cities have. Um, but one thing you will not find in, uh, in any rent control ordinance that I'm familiar with is uh, an extended notice of termination provision. And that's specifically what the case that I mentioned at the outset um, addresses, not rent control and not just cause eviction. And the other question from Ms. Berger was nine, uh, there's an optional thing. Um, she brought up a city that has an option of, I guess voluntary uh, of, on the part of the landlord to give 90 days or then just cover the tenant by just cause. Do you, are you familiar with what she was referring to? Um, I, I'm not familiar with that ordinance. Um, that was not the direction that was given to me by council. And if the council is inter interested in exploring that, I, I could analyze that and, and report back. Um, on the face of it, I, it seems to me like that likely conflicts with um, the, the civil code provision. But again, um, I, I have not analyzed that specifically. Thank you. Um, I want to appreciate um, council members for um, delving into this conversation. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm gonna support the, mo the motion because I think it does, um, you know, in the end, it's going to hurt the city and, and I don't see a real win there. Although I, I agree with Mr. Graham that testing sometimes um, is, is can, can yield different results. Uh, I think in this battle though, for this particular one, I think keeping our powder dry, whatever that expression is, is probably a better uh, way to go. But um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. So is there any further discussion on this item? Okay, we have a motion by um, Council Member Matthews that was seconded by myself to table um, um, the first item on the agenda, which is the 90 day notice of termination of residential tenancy ordinance. Um, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes unanimously with Council Member Naroyan absent. Okay, that brings up um, item number two, and we'll leave some time to transition. And before we begin, um, I'd just like to ask um, the city attorney, because there may be um, 
uh, at least two of us may need to leave a little early on this, and I wanted to know, uh, having a council of four, that constitute a quorum to take action? A council of four uh, could take action. It would require a unanimous vote, but okay. yes, you could take action. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, on, on that, I would, I would also like to table this, I would make a motion to table it until the um, second meeting in January so that the new council, once it's seated, can get up to speed on, on the ADU ordinance because I think it's uh, that important and they're gonna be dealing with it for the next years to come and it would be, um, I think, expeditious. So I, I'll just make a motion because I agree with you. Also, um, if we're not gonna have the time to uh, discuss it appropriately, uh, Council Member Naroyan is not here as well um, and I, I, I well, that's my motion anyway. Second. Okay, is there any further discussion on this? Yeah, um, this was explicitly at the direction of the Homeless Blueprint, uh, Blueprint Subcommittee of all three members are here, and we expressly said that we wanted this to come back to council as soon as possible, um, and here we are. So we have plenty of time to have a discussion, and this was at our direction, and the three of us who were on that committee are here to represent it, so I, um, I'm not gonna support the motion on the floor. I just, um, I'll, I'll say that I was one of the people, I, and I gave some advance notice, I need to leave early on this, so I'm not gonna be here for the full um, agenda item, and I've already given advance notice to um, um, Vice Mayor Watkins, so I'll be leaving early. Um, I mean, I'll, I'm, I'll just, I'll you know say that um, I'm, if we do continue, just know that I, I won't be here likely at the, uh, to uh, take action on it at the end of the, of the matter. I too will mean to be leaving. I have, um, I had given my availability, uh, unavailable earlier, but I have a personal emergency that's come up and um, I, I just am not gonna be able to stay. Um, I'm sorry that I won't be able to weigh in. I've participated in the housing blueprint subcommittee process and um, if the rest of the council wants to go ahead and you can maintain a quorum, then um, that is carry on and I apologize. Councilmember Chase. Is there room on the next agenda uh, to hear this item? December 11th. We had it scheduled for the second reading, but I don't think there's room on the agenda to hear the item now. Mm -hmm. Councilmember uh, Matthews. When do the two of you need to leave? I need to leave by, um, I'd say three. We originally were gonna schedule this for 11 and there was a conflict um, um, with that, late, that earlier start time. I had, when we originally, I just had anticipated this being an evening item and I'm trying to arrange my day, but I do have some personal issues that I'm just, I, I can't be here for the whole time well, during the day. I originally started. thought it would be early in the day and I just scrubbed my whole day. So um, this is disappointing because I think there are some issues to be resolved. I think this is one thing with all the preliminary work that's gone on where we can move this forward and start to see some progress on uh, the narrow field of uh, increasing housing supply. I'd personally like to go forward, but given the time, you're both leaving at th three? I am, I don't know what time. Maybe we should do a straw poll. Well, there's a motion on the floor. floor and you know, table. for the record, I wanna say that, you know, seven o'clock is the appropriate time to be doing these um, discussions. Uh, when the community can come, the people after work can come. The ADU ordinance spec particularly um, has to do with you know, homeowners and uh, many of them are working during the day. And so I, I don't understand why we do this in the afternoon, but. Well, it was originally scheduled. It was evening. scheduled for an evening. It got continued to a specific day. And then we had, there was a conflict scheduling for the evening and so we're gonna schedule it in the morning. And that was. Yeah. So we I have a motion. So I would like, I have not yet heard a definitive comment from either council members Chase or Watkins, what your preferences are under the circumstances. I mean, I think given the fact that we delayed the item once before, I feel 
it's unfortunate to continue to delay it, but if we're only gonna have four at a certain point when we have to make a decision and we won't be able to move any of the items anyways, then, I mean, sadly, I would say then that probably would be best to delay it, but I would prefer to hear it because I'm here and I'm ready to do it, but <laughs> we can control schedules. Well, I, I'm I am disappointed also if this is something that we worked really hard to get before this council and but if there if we can't logistically do it, I guess we have to move it. So the anticipation, let me ask the question, would be to move it to our uh, marathon meeting next week or bump to next next year. I think this would require two readings. Yeah. Yeah, so we could start it in our next meeting. I don't I don't think there's room on the next meeting It, it is a busy schedule. You would probably need to start early, early really early How early like 10 in the morning? Yeah, I mean this So let's do that. I, I'm game frankly. I am too. That's fine Earlier you have to be earlier I'll support the motion on the floor if we're moving it to have the first reading in our December 11th meeting. If not, I'll vote. I will oppose the motion. The purpose of the motion is for the new council to hear about ADUs and about this ordinance. So I, I, I'm, yeah, I wouldn't support that. I Although understand the intention, moving but it, we all, but we all take votes on things that the next council then picks up. We are subject to the same thing. That's how government works. So moving it would be the the second reading would be in January, so the new council would be. Would still get um, to weigh in on it. Yeah. Okay, so I'm I'm, I'm amenable to that then. Okay, and then the start time would need to be. Uh, tentatively, um, I have it at eleven. Yeah, but um, I think. And this was slated to be about a two-hour item. Start at nine. Start at nine. So what is your? Is that I get up at six o'clock, so I'm okay. Right, at six thirty-seven. Okay. Can I, I, I mean, it, that, it's not that this item would be at that time because there's other business. There might be some other other work that would take place beforehand. That, that's absolutely fine with me. And again, I, as somebody who's causing some of the disruption here, I, I really just have a, a personal emergency and I can make, if I plan for it, I can make time to be here for longer on next Tuesday. What's that's the earliest fine. Someone, uh, what's the earliest intern? We've had budget meetings that have begun at like 8.30, mm -hmm. 8, 8 o'clock. So let's tentatively schedule this to begin at 8.30 a.m. And that's not when this particular item will be, um, but um, if, and if that's part of your motion, uh, Council Member Crone? Um, no, I'm gonna uh, withdraw my motion because I, again, don't feel like we should be listening to stuff that's of real interest outside of, um, and you know, hours, you know, bankers hours, they used to call them. So, I mean, this is not what, where people can come to meetings and be here. So I, I'll just withdraw the motion. Okay, Council Member Matthews. In that case, in case, I'll move that we continue this item to our next meeting and schedule that meeting to begin at 8.30. Second. Okay, there's a motion by Council Member Matthews, seconded by uh, Council Member Chase. Um, any further discussion? I just might be a few minutes late to the 8.30, but I will do my best. And, and as you know, this may not be the item that starts. Yeah. This that is not, meeting. yeah, we'll have it scheduled after. Sure. And I'll just say, I, I make this motion in the interest of moving this forward after two and a half years or more of uh, very deep community engagement, community outreach, community input, specifically on this particular topic. Um, these recommendations, not all of which I agree with, but they've been vetted, they've been brought forward, and um, I think we have the opportunity to move on them. Uh, the new council will certainly have the opportunity to weigh in in all that, all its many forms, but it's an opportunity to uh, actually see something move. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Council Just, Member just so the public knows what we're doing, and I, I apologize that uh, we're put, delaying this vote, and um, you know, it's not a good thing. It's not good process that we're engaged in, but this is reality because people have other lives outside of city council as well. I'm sorry. Um, I guess one, one, um, one thought is anybody that's here that may not be able to attend um, the meeting on the 11th could provide comment 
um, at this point. Um, obviously, if it's continued to that next meeting, um, they wouldn't be speaking there if they did attend. Is that something that we could entertain? You could, but it's not required for a, an item that's being tabled. Okay. Interest gate is good. Okay, so we have a motion and a second on the on the floor about um, tabling this for the to the December 11th meeting. I think I'll take public comment on that sole issue about um, moving this. So. Um, is there any member of the public would like to speak in regards to just the idea of rescheduling this to the uh, 11th meeting? How many people, if you'd raise your hand? Two people, okay, go right ahead, sir. You in two minutes, two. Good afternoon, I'm Scott Graham. Uh, I came to the last meeting to address this issue. Now I'm at this meeting to address this issue. So like there were, we're gonna be 15 meetings from now when I can actually address this issue. Thank you, next. Sorry, I, I kind of feel the same way. I wanted to speak the last time. I want to speak this time. I can't come next time. There are two people behind me in the same boat. So I agree that it would be nice to have it in the evening when people could come, but some people took off time to come today. And is there, I don't know the process, is there a way to have partial public comment and then table, I, I don't know. That's up to you, but it would be nice. Right, thank you. Next speaker. Yeah, I would suggest that the council, out of respect for the public who came here, essentially extend the public comment period so that it can at least, they can say what they came to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there any other member of the public would like to speak to the issue about um, scheduling or scheduling a meeting out to December 11th? Uh, count, uh, Micah. I mean, a few weeks here and there is no big deal, but you know, like I'm hoping to build an ADU at some point and the farther it gets pushed back, then it starts raining and whatnot. So if you push it back, I hope that, you know, a lot of you will be on the new council that you'll act with some decisiveness. You know, like I said, it's not a big deal to do five days or whatever, but I think these, most of these proposals, I think aren't really that controversial and I hope that you'll start acting on them sooner than later. Thank you. Okay, see no other public comment, I'll bring it back for discussion. Um, what about the idea of the um, having people that are here speak on public comment? Okay. Uh, I, I think the uh, typical way of handling that is to, correct me if I'm wrong, open the public hearing, those that can't come to the delayed um, uh, meeting, make their comments here, but do not speak at the, at the subsequent one. I frankly, think it'd be in people's best interests if they can to come back when we have a full council, we have time, we're giving it a full hearing. For those who can't. For those who can't, if they want to I think say fair. something right now, I'm fine with it. Okay. Okay. With the understanding that they won't speak at the upcoming okay. meeting. All right, then what I'll do is open up the public hearing uh, at this point on this item, item number two, for the accessory dwelling unit ordinance amendments. For those of you that are unable to make it for the next uh, meeting on December 11th, please, you can come forward and speak. And are there any members of the public that wish to speak at this time? Okay, you'll have three minutes. I'm sorry, I thought they were gonna stay and speak and then they left, so what can I say? Um, thank you, though. I'll be brief. I just want to say thank you for being willing to address the whole issue of ADUs. I personally think adding ADUs to the menu of housing possibilities in our city is one thing that will save us. The people who can build them will be the ones who bear the costs. The city won't have to pay like it would with affordable housing or Measure H or any of the other ideas that we've contemplated. This is one way that could be cost effective that could allow people to build. So, um, uh, way to go, kudos. Um, one thing I would like to say, I built an ADU in 2003, as you know, you've heard me ad nauseum, for my parents. But because I was an early adopter, I've had a lot of people come to me and ask me about ADU questions. And so I'm familiar with people who are building, people who are thinking about building. So there are quite a few in the pipeline. And uh, there are two things I think that are missing in the proposal. The rest of it I think is great. One, um, so I have one friend who got her uh, occupancy permit today and super stoked, 600 square foot ADU, uh, cost $290,000 to build. It's not that fancy, but it's, that's what it costs. I have a, my neighbor across the street is finishing his, he's in the last <coughs> stages. 
it's under 500 square feet, $270,000. These are very, very expensive units to build. So one thing that's missing from the proposal is anything that you could do to reduce fees would be awesome because fees are really expensive. And you know, some of the building costs you can't help, but the fees you could help, and that would be a great improvement. Secondly, um, and I think something that's a little more subtle, but is also connected to the whole just cause eviction, rent control, measure M, et cetera, that you will undoubtedly be talked about for the next six months to a year, is that there are people, and I'll throw myself in the, in the packet, we have a proposal at the building department right now for an ADU on my son's property, which we won't build if there are stringent just cause evictions put in that are similar to what we're in Measure M. I think a rent increase would be, or ceiling, fine, but if you do anything that limits people's flexibility, move their families in, or to use their own property, you're gonna end up with fewer ADUs. So it's great on one hand to make it as easy as possible. It's gonna shoot you in the foot if you go ahead and make it inflexible or controlling over people who have ADUs. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Go ahead, sir, or. Good afternoon, council members. First of all, thank you for all your hard work and dedication as uh, city council members. It's gotta be rough, rough, rough. Um, my husband and I have lived in Santa Cruz our whole lives. Our daughter's a fourth generation Santa Cruzan, and we've lived in our current home for 33 years on the west side of Santa Cruz on Alta Vista Drive. I wrote a letter to the Planning Commission a month or so ago, which you've probably already read, but I thought I would follow it up with coming to speak to you personally. I'm not opposed to ADUs, granny units, as originally proposed. We have one next to us, and I understand the need for them. The father lives in the ADU and takes care of the children now and again. On the other side of us is a UCSC rental property with six students who have six cars. And um, my opposition to the proposed changes are primarily twofold. Parking impacts and safety impacts. Parking impacts, if you remove the requirement for the ADU to have one off-street parking spot, then the occupants of the ADU will be parking on the street. Could be one, two, three cars. To think that the occupants of the ADU will not have a car or several cars is not realistic. The west side is already heavily impacted by the cars of UCSC students, and this is only gonna make the situation worse. Safety impacts, if you allow a new ADU to be a short-term rental for three years, we will not have any we will not only have more parking impacts, but safety issues as well. Single family residential properties were intended for families. So you'll be putting a short term rental right next to a home with children without even knowing who the folks are renting the ADU on a short term basis. Rotating, 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 it scares the heck out of me. The police have moved to a model of community policing, which has the premise of getting to know your community police team assigned to your neighborhood, your neighbors, and everybody looking out for one another. The proposal of having ADUs be short-term rentals goes completely against this model, and it's a contradiction of what the city says it's trying to accomplish. Seems to me that rather than trying to get ADUs in every backyard to help with our housing crisis, we should be focusing on major discussions with UC Regents on somehow convincing them to provide housing for their students here in Santa Cruz. I know it's very Pollyanna, but they're <laughs> a big part of our problem, our housing problem. I am hoping that these discussions are currently happening and we just haven't heard about them yet. And I would suppose they are happening. Please reject the proposed changes to ordinance for ADUs and start to represent your constituency that has worked all of our lives to build a home here in Santa Cruz. We raised our children here, we pay taxes, and we're good citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Elise Casby and I'm an activist here. Um, 
So I'm afraid I have to admit once again that there, there are many facets of the housing issue that I just don't have any kind of expert knowledge about. I have followed the discussions on the ADUs and I'm trying, <laughs> trying to learn as I go. Um, but the reason I'm speaking today, it has to do with Airbnb and it has to do with, with number of units. Uh, the woman before me who just spoke, I think raised a really valid issue about parking. And I, I just wanna say that I, I really get the feeling that, and, and I've been studying this as well, so it's not just a feeling, it's something that I've been studying in formal classes. We're, we're at a time when a lot of our paradigms are changing. So the paradigm of, for example, a family home with a couple of cars in the driveway, that was standard, that was something that a lot of people could attain in post-World War II economics. At this point, we have many, many, many more people who are traveling, who are actually transient people, in the sense that they go where they can get jobs. They're single, uh, they're often single parents with children, and so we still have a lot of people who are in family traditional situations, two parents and many, maybe several children or whatever. But the reason that I'm bringing this up is because the people that are really getting left out of this equation, I feel, are the, the not rich and the not even very middle class people. So students, um, people who have worked in human services who just were not in really for-profit fields, uh, poor people, just a lot of poor people. I mean, I wish I could quote a lot of statistics and stuff right now, but I think what, what I wanna say to this issue is just that I really feel like we really need to revisit the housing issue in terms of people in general, single people, and we also need to include environmental standards. And I'll just go into this area. I know y'all have heard this before, so excuse me for a little bit of redundancy, but I did go to the College of Environmental Design, which was looking at problems like this from a standpoint of, of trying to be open-minded and really solve problems. There are designs in the world where people can live in situations that are maybe not as spacious, reduced situations where certain um, functions such as eating or common rooms, they can have shared spaces. And there's also, even in LA, there was a healthy discussion a few years back about building um, units for single people. So I just really urge you to, to give this conversation its full due and consider the entire community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Scott, we're gonna speak. Is there any other members of the public that wish to speak to this item? <coughs> Good afternoon, I'm Scott Graham. Um, there's a number of issues uh, about this that I wanna bring up. One is I hope that you will comply with the new state laws concerning the ADUs that was passed in I believe in October. Uh, another thing is the idea of these <coughs> summertime, uh, you know, Airbnb rentals. And then, you know, during the, the uh, school year, renting to students. I don't think we should be accommodating the university. They're not accommodating us. So why should we make rules that accommodate them? Uh, another issue is the um, owner needs to live on the property thing. I think if the owner lives within the county, they should be allowed to have an ADU. Or if the property is managed by a local company, and maybe there's some way of like uh, <clears throat> giving adjoining properties phone numbers of people to call, you know, either the actual owner or the property property manager, so that if there is a problem, there's a way to address it instead of like you know people not being able to address problems. Uh, <clears throat> the other issue is. Uh, The uh, ADUs that are currently out there that are not uh, considered legal at the moment, that they didn't have permits to build them, that they were built years ago and people live in them. And I would uh, hope that people, that the city would allow 
landlords to try to make those units comply rather than just kicking people out. That the, there needs to be a, a vehicle so that compliance can happen and people aren't losing their housing. Another issue is what's going on in the county right now where if the um, owner of an ADU that wants to create one or legalize one signs an agreement for 20 years of low income uh, you know, under the HUD guidelines <clears throat> that they don't have to pay any fees. It's sort of like the, they're signing this agreement where it's basically a loan to pay the fees. And if they go 20 years and keep it low income, at the end of the 20 years, the loan is forgiven. So I, I would like to see the city do something like what the county is doing as far as a fee-free uh, ADU compliance or creation ordinance. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any other members of the public that wish to speak to this item? I'll bring it back to the council. And again, that, that closes the um, public comment period on this. We'll continue the item. Well, there's a motion on the floor to continue this item to the December 11th meeting. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion on the floor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, that motion passes with Council Member Crone voting no um, and Council Member Naroyan absent. All other Council Members voting uh, yes. The meeting's adjourned.